Yeah, I thought about giving him the scriptures to put up on the board, but I'm not used to that. I'm used to going to Dover where I'm used to going to Dover where it's just flip, 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 and this, 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 and everything is scripture, scripture, scripture. So that's kind of what I grew up with. So I'm going to do that to you today. I also need to figure out if I can read this with or th- without my glasses. It's kind of a, I got new glasses and I see worse than I did before, but you forge through. Well, the focus of my talk today is uh, turn up the heat. And that's the only thing I gave him, turn up the heat. So that, I don't know if that's back there yet or not, but um, it's about the pressure that you're faced um, w- with in life. And I'm not a trained speaker, so I'm going to rely on some props, and don't you laugh at me <laughs> for props. Does everybody know what this is? It's a lava lamp. And it's supposed to calm down here in a second because I didn't really want to get started with that in motion. But lava lamps are kind of like kids. They don't do exactly what you want them to do at the time you want them to do them. But I'm thinking it's about ready to settle down there. So many of us know what this is. And some of you may know the conditions under which they were generally used years ago. I found it cheap, so I just bought it. (laughs) Um, As it sits here right now, It's perfectly good. It's as good as the day it was made. But it's not accomplishing all that it was meant to do. It takes an outside force to activate an unseen energy to produce light. Now, there are several places in the Bible where Jesus says he is the light of the world. Uh, For instance, John 8, verse 12. Then spake Jesus again to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. So now we too have this light, and uh, we're a light for others. Matthew 5, 14, ye are the light of the world. A city that's set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So it's sitting there producing light before men, and in this condition, it's perfectly good, as good as the day it was made. But as it is here, it's not accomplishing all it was created to do. It is starting to get in that direction, though. It's doing what it's accomplished to do. Sometimes at work or school, um, in your family, Things are clicking along, you feel accomplished and productive. You'll be 100% what you've been made to do. Other times you have deadlines, constant phone calls, arguments, angry coworkers. Um, The heat gets turned up a little bit. And now none of us here are in that 100% mode. I'm gonna go out on a limb there. But God knows what we need next to get us to our next percentile of what we can handle, whatever that is. Now, no one likes having the heat turned up in our lives. It's uncomfortable and it hurts sometimes. But if the heat isn't turned on and up, we won't be what God has created to do and to be. This lamp produces light, but you don't get the full effect until the heat produces the effect. So we'll address the standard question when things get hot. And we've talked about this uh, generally just about every week, I think, for the last several months. Why does God allow suffering anyway? You hear this all the time. It's usually it's from sinners that are just not quite ready to address their situation. Uh, They're trying to push God away. Um, I looked around a little bit on the Google machine, and there are all kinds of stuff on that. But a really good page that I found was um, house2house.com, they had a, a page on why God allows suffering. And they made some pretty good bullet points that I wanted to, to address. Um, unbelievers stumble over the problem of evil, and Christians sometimes doubt about God when suffering. They all wonder, how could a good God allow evil? Why doesn't an almighty God do something about it? Couldn't an omnipotent God create a world without evil? Well, he did, but we just chose not to live there. 
Why doesn't a loving God help his children when they're hurting? All of the usual reasons that the people use to distance themselves from their commitment to God. Uh, for those weak in the faith, and that includes us sometimes, it's easy to come to these questions. We're, we're just struggling with, with too much at once, it seems like. We've all been through this stuff, though, and we know the answers to these questions, uh, for the most part, we do. Here's the thing. If Christians live blatantly under God's protection, talk about a bunch of brats. Can you imagine? What would the repercussions be? People would live in utter chaos. People would become reckless. And in a way, we wouldn't respect God because he'd be there to do our bidding, so to speak. Pride much, Lloyd? <laughs> Pride much? Ye shall be as gods much? Uh, there are good reasons why. Uh, and for instance, we'd eat horribly. We wouldn't take care of ourselves. Why should we? If God's going to not let anything bad happen. We could just eat whatever we want. We drive like maniacs, even more so than you see people do now. People drive, and now that I'm on uh, 171, more now. People drive because they're angry, they drive because they're in a hurry, or they drive because they're not paying attention. Those are three very dangerous reasons to be out on the road. But we've got to deal with things like that. We'd take all kinds of risks if God was there just to protect us all the time. Throw yourself off a cliff, it'll be fun. Well, Jesus wouldn't even do that. Luke 4 and 9, and he, Satan, brought him to Jerusalem and set him on a pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if, and I want that word to just hang out there for a little bit, Satan's saying, if you are who you say you are, cast thyself down from hence, for it is written, he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time they dash thy foot against a stone. And Jesus answering said unto him, It is said, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. We'd be really shallow. And not only that, we'd be greedy, always testing the waters. You've seen the kids in the, the shopping marts. You hear them way in the back. And you hear them and they're screaming and kicking and they're all the way up to the front, you know, they're taking them out. That would be us. That would be us. Now, if God handled us this way, people would fail to develop spiritually as well. We've talked about this quite a bit uh, uh, over the last several months in our Bible studies. Um, and going back to Job, Job 1, 8 through 11. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? And there is none like him on the earth, a perfect and upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Hast thou not made a hedge about him and about his house and about all that he hath on every side? Thou hast blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. But put forth thy hand now and touch all that he hath and he will curse thee to thy face. Did God do everything to, for Job and make his life easy? Probably not. He, uh, I'm sure he faced many, many challenges, as we all do, and challenges not written in the book of Job. I mean, he had to get to that point, and you don't get to that point without a little bit of heat. So I'm, I'm sure Job had, had handled all of his challenges um, to come to the point where he is the example for us that he is in the Bible. Now, I'm sure God knew how the deck was stacked because he brought this up uh, to Satan. Wouldn't you like to heard that conversation in a little bit different way outside of the Bible? It's just, hey, Satan, come here. He saw the end from the beginning. Anyway, Job was ahead of most to begin with, but there's always room for improvement. So God did what Satan suggested, and more, actually, while he was yet speaking. While he was yet speaking. While he was yet speaking. Three times that's brought up. Three times stands for completeness. He was completely broken down. Job's entire world collapsed in a heap before him. And talk about being in shock. Who was Job left with? Satan asked God to touch all that he hath, but God took it one step further and left Job with one thing. 
the bone of his bones and the flesh of his flesh. Her advice, curse God and die. The, the one person that should have been through everything with him, stuck with him throughout everything, curse God and die. Now, mom, can't you imagine? <laughs> I would think she would be a complete and total puddle of goo by that time, one hot mess. But no, curse God and die. That was her, that was her help. If God didn't allow suffering, we wouldn't develop sympathy or empathy, and that's really important. Christ suffered like we do, and in Hebrews 4, 15, for we have not a, higher, a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. God sends us out to be a light. We are a light to draw others, and that light takes all forms. How can we counsel if we don't have the experience to really understand and apply God's word? After all, if, if I go through a tough time, I'm going to be looking for scriptures that are going to be helping me in my situation. And God will remind me of those at the right time. And the right time usually is when you need to help someone else. He's pretty good at putting people together at the right time. Now, there's loss of a loved one. Everyone goes through that but everyone goes through that for the first time. Help with that is good if you've got someone to help you through that. That's really good. How can you help someone if you don't really understand what they're going through? Now there's betrayal by loved ones. The story of Joseph is a good example. How did God see that situation through? And then there's physical infirmities that we all have to deal with. Um, I was at Dover one year and I think it was Brian Burrell was asking for suggestions for the men's Bible study that day. <clears throat> and he asked me if I had any, any thoughts. Well, I had just been diagnosed very recently with high blood pressure. And I said, well, I am kind of going through a problem with that right now because I know I need to pray for that situation, but it's kind of like praying that I'm not gonna get old. And that's not right either. <laughs> so Brian, he, he latched onto that. He brought that up. And of course, there, there were other people there with many more physical infirmities than I had. And they reinforced the fact that, yes, you do pray for that kind of stuff. <laughs> so I still, in the back of my mind, though, it's just how can you pray for yourself not to get old? I mean, that's, that's not going to happen. But at any rate, there's, there's serious physical needs that, that you do need to pray for. And you need to encourage others as they go through that. Second Corinthians 1 and 4 Paul was kind of wordy, so bear with me on this. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. We are going to experience trials and sinners are going to be experiencing true pain. It's a tough world, especially when you're stumbling around in the darkness. How could we possibly help others in need if we didn't recognize and be able to empathize with them and show them we do understand what we're going through and give them a direction, uh, kind of the, the hope that's within us. We have to share that with them. They have a direction that they can, they can take. Okay, if we couldn't choose our paths, if things were done for us, people would complain that their free will was taken away. We'd be slaves. And quite literally, that would be the case. God doesn't want slaves. He gives us free will. Uh, rule number one, evil does exist. And rule number two is rule number one exists. <laughs> rule number three, you have the ability to choose your direction. Deuteronomy 30, 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life that both thou and thy seed may live. It's pretty easy to see that. Come on, choose life. And we all know that the wages of sin is death. So we do have free will, but that comes with a cost, just as it did for Adam and Eve. Okay, back to the heat. 1 Peter 4 and 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing happened unto you. And let's go on just a little bit further than that, because it's just good to hear 
13, but rejoice inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. If ye be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye, for the spirit of glory of God resteth upon you. On their part is he evil spoken of, but on your part he's glorified. And I'm reminded of, of a time, I grew up in the church, but in our a lot of times the way of witnessing to people is, here's some tracks, let's, let's go knock on doors. And that scared me to death. I didn't like that at all. But it wasn't until about, oh, I don't know, 15 years ago, somebody said, actually told me how to do that. And one thing that I remember him saying was, you know, if they rebuke you, they're not rebuking you, they're rebuking Christ, and he's big enough to handle it, okay? So, in any way, they can speak evil in, on him, but in, for your part, you're glorified. And you don't know what part of the day you're in. Um, you may have to endure for a long or short time when you have struggles like this, when the heat's on. Uh, Matthew 20, the workers in the vineyard. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and the heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst thou not agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto the last, even as, even as unto thee. It is, not, is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the heat that you endure may last a long time. It may last for years. Uh, it may last for a short time. Or, you know, if you see someone else burdening, burdening, burdened under a, a problem, sometimes their solution comes a lot quicker than you might think. But we're all in it together. We're all in it for the time that God requires of us. Uh, one of the most miserable nights I spent in my life was south here at the Cub Scout camp. It was the August after the tornado, and we were doing cleanup for the schools in the area uh, to get it ready for school to start. It was about that night, it was probably 110 uh, for the low that night. I mean, it was just so totally out of context. Um, and, and it was miserable because it was out of context like that. But we made it. We provided a good outcome for the next day, and I have that good and horrible experience to remember. <laughs> it was really miserable. We used it as an opportunity to teach the boys how to handle themselves in conditions like that the next day. Uh, you find shade, you find water, you pace yourself, and no one had a problem. We didn't, uh, there were a thousand scouts uh, that, that day cleaning up no one had a problem uh, because they all were taught this is how you handle yourself in conditions like this. Good, le good lessons were learned by everyone and uh, the result benefited in the school kids for, for this area. Sometimes we simply just have to take the heat. Sometimes there's a higher purpose uh, to be accomplished. Uh, do you trust God to set up all the dominoes in your situation? Sure. Do you wait upon the Lord until his will can be accomplished? Of course. We understand that he sees the end from the beginning. Um, if that's the case, we also have to understand that sometimes we're the dominoes. And where he places us um, can be a little warm, but it's either for our benefit later on or for someone else's. Um, you have to pave a way. Sometimes with that heat, you're being refined 1 Peter 1, 7, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Remember, when Jesus returns, we will glorify him when he does. Oh, I want to be there. Look upon his face. <laughs> you know. With God, all things are possible more than we can imagine. And you can stand any heat that he gives you. Of course, I can't do this without going back to Daniel 3.19. Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. 
And I've always wondered, how do you do that? If it's a furnace, furnaces are supposed to be hot. How do you heat it seven times more than what it's intended to be heated? Now, I'm sure there's a, a message there. Seven is complete. Uh, seven is perfect in the Bible. So it must have been something to do with the completeness and the perfection of their ultimate doom. He was going to just fry them into nothing. Didn't work that way, did it? God turned tragedy into the impossible for his glory. Verse 24, then King Nebuchadnezzar leaped to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, weren't there three men that, that tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, certainly, your majesty. He said, look, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed. And the fourth looks like the son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and, and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the most high God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. They are just in there waiting. That's all. And the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded about them. They said that the fire had, they saw that the fire had not harmed their bodies, nor was a hair on their heads singed. Their robes were not scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. They trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who shall say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, be cut into pieces and their houses be turned into piles of rubble, for no other God can save in this way. So it's a process, but he got the idea. It was a start. He, he was set on his path, and it made him a believer. <clears throat> we can't make God turn off our heat. I mean, we can ask God for what we want, and we can tell him what we want. But again, Abba Father, you know, I want you to do this for me, but your will. Now, no more than this lamp can cry out to the utility company to turn off the heat. Heat comes from sources all around us, often unseen and unexpected, but God controls the switch. Mark 14, and he said, Abba Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. Sometimes the answer to our prayer is simply no. And as I said downstairs this morning, some, most times it's wait because the dominoes are still being set up. Do we trust God to make impossible situations, even those like Daniel, and make them into wonderful things? Yeah. Although we must go through it, God has overcome tribulation. Acts 14.22 <clears throat> confirming the souls of the disciples and exhorting them to continue in the faith and that we must, through much tribulation, enter into the kingdom of God. So if someone needs bubble wrap, if they need coloring books or puzzles, if they need a safe zone to get through the day or get through their lives, what does that say about them? What does that say about the direction they are choosing for themselves? Hashtag broad and winding. Romans 5, 3 through 5, and not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost which is given unto us. In John 16, 33, these things have I spoken unto you, that in, in me ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. I've done it, it's gone. I've overcome the world, past tense. He's been there, done that, and remember, he's our big brother. He's gonna take care of us. So here we're getting to the, to the meat of it, I think. Uh, Corinthians 1, 4, who comforteth us in all our tribulation that we may be able to comfort them which are in trouble, in any trouble, in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. In 2 Corinthians 7, 4, great is my boldness of speech toward you. Great is my glorying of you. I am filled with comfort. I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. So when the heat comes, look to God, 
praise his name. There's always, in all tribulation, there's something to praise God about. So focus on that. Don't focus on the heat. Focus on your Redeemer. Thank him for his mercies. In all things, give thanks. And understand he's got our back, and there is an end, and there is an end result. You'll be stronger, and you'll be able to comfort others like you were comforted because you've had the experience. So those are some things you can focus on. You have to take the heat to activate you. It's like this lamp. So you can accomplish the things you were personally created to do. And that's always more than you can imagine. Always more than you can imagine. You can't do those things without the activating agent involved. That causes us to grow from where we are now, able to handle what we can at the time, uh, to being able to handle more, becoming more mature, allowing us to help others that are growing but need our spiritual advice, comfort, and encouragement. So as this lamp sits here now, it's perfectly good, as good as the day it was made, and now it's actually doing what it's supposed to do, providing light and showing its good works. But physically, as a lamp in this sanctuary during the day with all of these lights on, it's showing its good works, but it's really, is it really helping others that need light? No. That's why we were sent out into the world, into the darkness, so we can show our light. We can be a light to others, to be set on a hill and call others to Jesus. And finally, we get to the point where we can take the heat, understanding God has a plan for us, and uh, those we come in contact with are the ones that he brings us into contact with that might need our help. Uh, Philippians 4, 10 through 13. But I rejoice uh, in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me have flourished again wherein you, wherein you were called, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak of respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know how to be abased. I also, and, and I know how to to abound everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Hebrews 12.1 Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, is that race on a nice oval track with the breeze blowing and birds chirping and all that? No. Hills and valleys, mountains, rivers, floods. <laughs> it's, it's not easy all the time. I'm reminded of the runner's prayer. Dear Lord, if you promise to pick up my feet, I promise to put them back down. I like that. That's one of my favorite prayers <laughs> because that's sometimes all we can do. All we can do is, is trust in him and he will get us through it. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6. Let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have, for he has said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee, so that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. <clears throat> and then there comes an appointed time in all of our lives when our light goes out. Our race will have been run, our treasures stored up in heaven, our burdens laid down. When that race is over, what will happen then? Now the light we had and the heat that we burdened under will be over with. We'll be at rest. But the experiences that tried us and that we grew from and the spiritual advice we were able to offer, the memories we leave all of our good works will remain and they will be taken up by others and they in turn will light the path for others and bring more to Christ. <clears throat> uh, what we leave behind are the effects of the heat, our good works and the results of what we were created to do. <clears throat>